There we go. So welcome everyone to this first seminar of the year in the Seminar in Contemporary Marxist Theory series. So this is a seminar theory, uh, series that I think many of you know, but um, it's a series that where we have new books um, that are related to Marxist, contemporary Marxist theory in some way and discussants and a discussion um, around once a month or something. So uh, I'm gonna put the link to the Twitter and the Facebook uh, and the mailing list in the chat in a moment so that you can subscribe if you don't already. Uh, so my name is Ingrid von Graven and I'm um, the chair of the session today. And so in this session, we have with us Paul Kamak, uh, Serbe Kazar, uh, and Lucia Padella to discuss Paul's new book, which is The Politics of Global Competitiveness, uh, which came out just in 2022, so very fresh. Uh, and this book considers the transformation of work under capitalism and the roles that institutions like OECD and the World Bank have played in facilitating these transformations. Uh, so Paul Kamek is Honorary Professorial Research Fellow at the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. Uh, he reviews books at what's worth reading, what to read and what to avoid in and around critical political economy. And he works on the politics of global political economy more generally. And Serbik Kazar is a lecturer in the Department of Economics at SOAS, University of London. And her research interests are in the field of economic development and political economy of development specifically focusing on informal economy, processes of structural transformation and capitalist transition in labor surplus economies, issues of economic and social exclusion and decolonized approaches towards the discipline of economics. And last but not least, Lucia Pradella is a senior lecturer in international political economy at King's College London. She's the author of The Actuality of Marxist Capital and Globalization and the Critique of Political Economy, New Insights from Marxist Writings. She's also the co-editor of Polarizing Development, Alternatives to Neoliberalism and the Crisis, and the Routledge Handbook of Marxism and Post-Marxism. So this is a stellar lineup of speakers. Uh, we'll have Paul present his book first for 25 minutes, and then Serbia and Lucia will follow with comments uh, 10 minutes each. So this way we have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So please keep your questions uh, until then. You can put questions in the chat while the discussion is going on. Uh, and I'll take questions from the chat afterwards, um, but I'll also take, you know, raised hands at the end. Um, so that's all from me. Uh, over to Paul. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, well, I'm very grateful indeed to be invited to this world famous seminar. Uh, in some trepidation, of course, um, at least if I have to leave in, in uh, disgrace after the comments, I'm at home. So that won't be so bad at all. Um, Okay, so 25 years ago, I published a book on theories of political development called Capitalism and Democracy in the Third World. Once I finished it, I began to look at the World Bank and its annual world development reports, starting with the 1990 report, Poverty. It seemed to me that the bank was not so much attacking poverty as attacking the poor, advocating policies that would proletarianize them, bringing them into global labor markets to make them available for exploitation by capital. At the same time, I looked into the policy output of the much less studied Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, usually dismissed as a rich country club. This description turned out to be misleading. Since the mid-1990s at least, the OECD had been urging the advanced economies to carry out reforms to make their product markets more open and their labor markets more flexible in order to improve their own competitiveness and the overall level of competitiveness in the global economy. Not only that, but at the same time, it was urging emerging and developing economies too to carry out reforms that would make them more competitive in global markets. Its objective, I suggested in, in 2006, it's taken me a long time to, uh, to produce this book, uh, was the creation of a competitive capitalist economy of global scale infused throughout by the disciplines of capitalist competitiveness. Why would they want this? One thing was the hope that dynamic growth in the developing world would produce expanding markets for goods and services from advanced economies. But they also thought and said repeatedly that increased competition from the developing world through the removal of protective barriers, for example, would bring about creative destruction in the West. That is, it would force inefficient companies to invest or go out of business, 
thereby driving up the overall level of productivity. In other words, they were focused on the competitive dynamics of the global economy as a whole. In short, I, uh, I say, uh, you may not all agree, these organizations were not seeking to impose the interests of the West or the advanced economies over the rest of the world, as many radical critics routinely argued, but rather seeking to further the development of the world market or capitalism on a global scale. And their primary concern was not just with privatization regulation or the liberalization of trade, but with relations between capital and labor in individual states and across the global economy as a whole. At least I decided to explore this hypothesis further and to consider its theoretical implications. And the result is this book. How did I go about it? I read as much as I could of the earlier public policy output of the two organizations from 1961 for the OECD and from 1978 when the first World Development Report was published for the World Bank. Then I followed its evolution through to the early months of 2021. I did some work on the multilateral development banks, which didn't make it into the book, and also on the European Commission, which is a key player in the global politics of competitiveness and features heavily in the later chapters. And as I accumulated more and more empirical evidence, I tried to make sense of it by reference to Marx's critique of political economy, for the most part, Capital Volume One and, uh, and the Grundrisse. So what's the argument of the book? First, the two organizations engaged from the start in a single project, and increasingly in recent years, a joint project aimed at the development of capitalism on a global scale. They took complementary positions on this objective very early on, and they've never deviated from them. So in 1963, the first OECD Secretary General, Thorkill Christensen, advised European countries to abandon the protection of agriculture in order to take advantage of cheaper food production elsewhere, to channel workers into urban labor markets and thereby increase overall efficiency. He acknowledged that even this course would be, quote, socially and politically difficult. But he went further to say, in the long run, we must expect a spectacular increase in the imports of manufactured products originating in the poorer countries. Almost their only wealth is their plentiful low wage manpower. They must have modern techniques, but like the Japanese, they could adopt them gradually. We might perhaps envisage, he said, a large scale redeployment of industrial activity between the continents over the next few decades, which would mean a reorientation of European industry. It is not too soon to start preparing for this. He's addressing the advanced economies in the OECD. Whether we like it or not, Europe will be forced in the imminent future to change, not only her day-to-day -day policy, but also her economic and political structure under the pressure of inexorable forces, which entail ever growing interdependence between all the continents. Europe cannot live in isolation. There is no protection against the fundamental forces of history. From my perspective, the fundamental forces of history, politics of global, of the, of the fact of global competitiveness uh, or the inevitable development of the world market. Since then, the OECD has not just anticipated competition from developing countries, it has advocated it and worked to bring it about all the time urging developed countries to face up to the need for change. Here is a later Secretary General, Jean-Claude Pay, introducing the 1994 OECD job study, which argued for labor market reforms that would favor competitiveness. There is no doubt, he said, that the only way to achieve long-term success is to embrace change. Trying to slow the pace of change and artificially to protect uncompetitive activities would only make delayed adjustment more painful. For its part, the World Bank's first World Development Report argued too that developed countries should not use protectionism 
against manufacturers from developing countries, as they would be, quote, delaying some of the difficult structural adjustments that are necessary if there is to be a return to a higher growth path. Open trade policies would contribute to growth by fostering a division of labor that accelerates the upgrading of skills and labor productivity in industry, encouraging technological progress, providing an inflow of manufactured articles at lower prices that would, would reduce inflation and, quote, stimulating growth in the developing countries, causing a further expansion in the markets for the industrialized countries' exports. The employment problem in developing countries, he added, is not long-term joblessness, as conventionally understood, but absence of productive earning opportunities so that long hours of hard work yield only small incomes. This line of argument was consistently pursued thereafter, leading to the recommendation in 1990 in the volume Poverty of a strategy with two equally important elements, quote again, the first is to promote the productive use of the poor's most abundant asset, labor. It calls for policies that harness market incentives, social and political institutions, infrastructure and technology to that end. The second is to provide basic social services to the poor. Primary health care, family planning, nutrition and primary education are especially important. Well, on this basis, I argue that this is a single universal strategy coordinated to a significant extent aimed at developing the world market through increasing the productivity of workers by subjecting them directly to capital. Importantly, it requires structural adjustment, not only in the developing world, but first and foremost in the advanced economies themselves. And I don't see this as an emergent neoliberal strategy, but as a classical liberal strategy, reflecting Adam Smith's argument that the wealth of a nation depends on the proportion of its population in work and their productivity once in employment. And I think, uh, I probably should have left this bit out, I think the persuasiveness of my argument is significantly strengthened by the fact that this orientation has become much stronger in recent years, long after I first outlined it. So the passage of events has tended to reinforce my confidence. As the later chapters document, the OECD devotes increasing attention to devising strategies to get more people into work through reforming social protection, targeting hard to reach groups, stressing the need for the acquisition of skills and arguing for radical labor market reform. On a parallel track, the World Bank promotes what it calls good jobs linked to the world market and has recently launched an all out assault on informality, targeting the majority of workers across the world who are not yet wholly available to capital. That's in World Development Reports from 2013 onwards. Two examples. One, in chapter four, I document an ambitious joint initiative involving the European Commission, the OECD and the World Bank to combat joblessness and underemployment. The OECD responded to the global recession after 2008 with the argument that it was a good time to push through reforms to, quote, make work pay. While the European Commission focused in 2011 in a new publication, Employment and Social Development in Europe, on what it regarded as the problem of households with very low work intensity, too few members, in other words, in paid work. It now aimed to raise the employment rate of the population aged between 20 and 64 from 69 to 75%. And as part of this initiative, it commissioned the World Bank to carry out a study of labor market exclusion across the European Union, published in 2014 as portraits of, low, of labor exclusion. From 2016 onwards, the OECD contributed a further six national case studies intended to produce, quote, an improved understanding of the characteristics and labor market barriers of out of work and low work intensity individuals. The assumption was that even in the more advanced economies, appropriate policy reforms could squeeze out substantially more labor. To quote the OECD, 
there was enormous scope for activation and employment support policies to address potential employment barriers and strengthen labor market uh, attachment. And this went along with a sustained effort to water down labor rights, to legitimate casual and part-time work, and to do away as far as possible with the standard employment contract, largely now a thing of the past, that guaranteed full-time work, pension and redundancy rights, and other protections. By this time then, the focus of the OECD and the World Bank, working together and working here with the European Commission, was explicitly on extracting more and more productive labor from populations increasingly subject to direct exploitation by capital in a radically deregulated labor market. Two, second example, brief one. This trend recently culminated in the World Bank's Human Capital Project and Human Capital Index, the latter, quote, designed to highlight how improvements in the current education and health outcomes shape the productivity of the next generation of workers. The essence of this project is captured in a notorious table buried in the middle of the, of the report launched this project that estimates specifically and precisely, quote, the productivity as a future worker of a child born in 2018. So this is what the World Bank is, is, is doing now. Estimates the productivity as a future worker of a child born in 2018 by combining measures of survival, schooling, and health. It offers the message that significant gaps in human capital persist across the world. These gaps, it says, manifested in low education and health outcomes hurt the future productivity of workers and future competitiveness of economies. So this is a culminating point in the development of this strategy. And absurdly enough, it does focus how on the question, how productive will a worker Will a person born in 2018 be when they enter the labour market in the future? What these examples tell us is that the OECD and the World Bank, along with the European Commission, now aim to make the relevant populations pure instruments for the extraction of surplus value by capital. And uh, as this presentation indicates, that's my view of what the purpose of OECD and World Bank policy intervention has always been from the very start and explicitly uh, presented as, as such. So some key features of the situation, and then I'll say something about the theoretical uh, underpinnings that I bring to it. Some key features of this situation are one, this is a long-term project. Even as OECD chief economist, Catherine Mann put it in 2014, a process with literally no end in view. Structural reform, she wrote, isn't a finite list of measures with an end date. It's an ongoing process to build more productive, inclusive and sustainable economies for our citizens. Two, it goes along as it happens with the, pro with the progressive decline of the share of advanced countries in Europe in particular in global income and trade. Three, it goes ahead too, regardless of crises, and indeed is intensified in times of crisis, in part because both organizations know perfectly well that crises will occur regularly and take advantage of them where possible, and in part because the underlying assumption is that there is still a very long way to go before the rule of capital is perfected. They're, they're un, uh, they don't flinch in the face of crisis. They, they, they press on, as we know, to our experience. Four, the sustained effort to draw women into paid work, particularly recently, hard to reach, in, in quotes, women such as the low skilled or those with infant and young children, continues and is intensified despite clear evidence of depletion or the threat to social reproductive roles widely regarded as essential. 
And these are all things that we might think need explanation or discussion, but they're features anyway of the policy orientation that I'm discussing. So, oh, section then, where does Marx come in? Everyone has their own uh, take on Marx, obviously. Yeah. And I'm speaking to people who maybe can know a great deal more about it than I do. But this is my take. It informs the analysis here. I start with the immanent tendencies or, or you know, abstract characteristics of the capitalist mode of production. First, capital takes the form of many separate capitals. So capitalists are obliged to compete with each other to sell the commodities they produce on the market. Second, they do so by driving down the cost of production in order to undercut their rivals. They can, they can do this by extending the working day, but in the capitalist mode of production in its pure form, they do so by investing in machinery to transform the production process and increase the productivity of workers. Third, this gives rise to uninterrupted processes of technological revolution and division of labor. Fourth, the capitalist mode of production tends to develop on a global scale, producing an ever expanding world market as individual capitals seek out new markets and new sources of labor. Fifth, and this is important uh, for some ramifications of the argument that I haven't time to address directly in this presentation. It tends to take over other earlier forms of production that Marx says, quote, appear more primitive from its standpoint, end quote, such as domestic household production or production in the informal economy. Quote again, every limit appears as a barrier to be overcome, initially to subjugate every moment of production itself to exchange and suspend the production of direct use values not entering into exchange. So sixth, the tendency to create the world market is directly given in the concept of capital itself. I focus, as, as you can already see clearly, much more on the world market than on the system of states, either historically or, or, or theoretically. And seventh, these processes create an ever-expanding class of persons dependent on capital for their survival, a proletariat that is also tendentially global in scale. This is the background to the central theoretical core of the book, Marx's general law of social production and its significance for the future of work. In a crucial passage of chapter 15 of Capital, Machinery and Large-Scale Industry, Marx develops the implications of the laws of motion of capital for the worker. First, he says, the principle of large-scale industry is to view each process of production in and for itself and to resolve it into its constituent elements without looking first at the ability of the human hand to perform the new processes. Second, modern industry never views or treats the existing form of a production process as the definitive one. By means of machinery, chemical processes and other methods, it is continually transforming not only the technical basis of production, but also the functions of the worker and the social combinations of the labor process. At the same time, it thereby also revolutionizes the division of labor within society and incessantly throws masses of capital and of workers from one branch of production to another. Thus, large scale industry by its very nature, necessitates variation of labor, fluidity of functions, and the mobility of the worker in all directions. And third, it follows that, quote again, this is the last quote, I think, this possibility of varying labor must become a general law of social production. And the existing relations must be adapted to permit its realization in practice. That monstrosity, the disposable working population held in reserve in misery for the changing requirements of capitalist exploitation must be replaced by the individual who is absolutely available for the different kinds of labor required of. The partially developed individual 
who is merely the bearer of one specialized social function must be replaced by the totally developed individual for whom the different social functions are different modes of activity taken up in turn. I'll just say briefly, I've, I've amended the translation of that passage because it is not sexist in German, but it is in 19th century English. So I, um, uh, I changed some he's to them's and so on. Okay, so more important in, in specific context today, this Marx's general law of social production, this is the creed, is my argument, by which the OECD and the World Bank live. And this is so because Marx here anticipates some significant aspects of global labor processes and labor markets today. The extreme fragmentation of labor processes in both industrial production and services, including in networks that operate on a global scale, the end of the job for life, in quotes, and the standard labor contract, the rise of the zero hour contract, and the huge emphasis placed on the need for prospective and actual workers to be mobile, adaptable, and versatile, and precisely absolutely available for the different kinds of labor required of them. The OECD and the World Bank promote all these crucial developments in global capital labor relations, and in each case with the explicit intention of maximizing the capacity of capital to extract relative surplus value from labor. In doing so, they embrace uncritically and enthusiastically the developments that Marx predicted through his critique of political economy. In conclusion then, the future Marx envisaged is already upon us, but we are only a little way in some ways along the way. Present circumstances confirm his insight that free competition made capital free while subjecting individuals to what appeared as objective powers ruling over them, and that this enslavement of individuals to an alien power would ultimately be perfected only in the world market. So Marx has the last word. It is not individuals who are set free by free competition. It is rather capital that is set free. It is nothing more than free development on a limited basis, the basis of, rule, of the rule of capital. This kind of individual freedom is therefore at the same time the most complete suspension of all individual freedom and the most complete subjugation of individuality under social conditions which assume the form of objective powers, even of overpowering objects of things independent of the relations among in individuals themselves. Thank you. 20 seconds late, sorry about that. Excellent time management. Uh, thank you so much. That was a really good introduction. Uh, so I will then pass it on to Servi to give the first um, set of comments. Thanks, Ingrid, and uh, thanks, Paul, for that uh, very interesting um, and succinct summary of uh, 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 extremely important uh, and brilliant work. So uh, what I want to say is that um, Paul Kamek's book, of course, offers a very powerful amount of the logic of capital operating through these global institutions in which uh, labor, which is kind of not even in its direct ambit of capital, is relentlessly brought into its ambit or you know uh, to batter down the Chinese walls basically till everything um, especially all surplus labor is in its access and it's it's a brilliant and a very careful reading of going through the various reports of World Bank and OECD and how they speak to the central uh, theme and the theoretical aspect that uh, Paul talked about towards the end and with some variations during the different conjunctures of capitalism and uh, the central uh, sort of uh, argument, however, remains intact and reinforced in these various phases. Where, I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant and a well-researched and amazingly researched work that I uh, thoroughly enjoyed read, reading. However, where I must mark my departure uh, from the argument is, to, is in terms of its economic functionalism and to what extent, you know, relatedly, um, how much does it explain the reality of post-colonial capitalism? And in that context, I'm going to raise two key points which are related. 
First is that uh, the idea of economic functionalism is if all sites are governed by the economic logic of capital, or in other words, any uh, sphere that is even not integrated directly in the capitalist production process exists mainly to serve the economic needs of capital. Or uh, if capital wishes to access labor from all spaces to proletarianize them and to increase their relative uh, to increase its relative surplus value, as Paul just pointed out, and if they're not incorporated, like I said, it would be to serve some economic need of capital, be it as reserve army of labor or otherwise. In these spheres, uh, Kamak also includes the sphere of social reproduction in both developed and developing countries, as well as the sphere of informal economy in the developing countries. While the role of households or social uh, reproduction in serving that economic function of capital has been well argued by Marxist feminist uh, in the Marxist feminist literature, as Kamak has highlighted in the book, however, the informal economy, how that is condensed in that logic, remains unclear to me. And the reason I say that is um, the informal economy is seen as the final space where dispersion of capital's need in terms of accessing labor happens. However, a significant proportion of informal economy in the developing economies are actually not wage workers, and instead they comprise of self-employed production processes that do not employ any wage, wake wage labor, are mainly marked by petty commodity production processes with mainly family workers without much possibility to accumulate over time. Insofar, capital's access to informal spaces is concerned, the story of post-colonial capitalism, therefore, could probably be distinct, something that would be advanced by scholars like Kalyan Sanyal, Partha Chatterjee, particularly studying the Indian uh, uh, scenario. What would be that alternate story? They would characterize post-colonial capitalism as one that is marked by an incompleteness of the process of primitive accumulation whereby capital is transfers resources from these pre-capitalist segments to the capitalist segments, while not being able to absorb the labor that is actually dispossessed. In doing so, this excluded labor is forced to reproduce this condition of livelihoods in the non-capitalist informal economy. Again, to, uh, just to clarify, this is not outside of capitalism, but this is how the production is uh, organized under capitalism. And I'll come to that point towards the end of uh, my intervention. So in that sense, the pop this excluded population is not merely a reserve army of labor or is not serving any economic need of the capital. It's not linked to the production process of capital through subcontracting, et cetera. Rather, it is often, or a large part of it is at least often surplus to the needs of capital. If you think about the informal economy in India, it's 90% is informal of which like 70% is self-employed petty producers without any wage work, which is trying to sustain just 10% of the formal, uh, uh, which is not clearly just trying to sustain 10% of the formal capitalist uh, sector. In this case, the production of uh, the, these non-capitalist spaces, which is the dominant part of the informal economy, is not due to a lack of capitalist growth process not being able to reach these spaces. Rather, the post-colonial capitalism is distinctly of the kind, it could be argued, which recreates the non-capitalist spaces and doesn't necessarily bring all of it within its ambit. The inability of capital to productively employ or absorb this sort of excess population, the surplus population, which is brought into existence because the first part of primitive accumulation happened where the dispossession did happen, but these workers were not proletarianized either partly or completely. In fact, this threatens the stability of capitalism because this is this excess unabsorbed mass that cannot be simply be allowed to perish. In that sense, a lot of policies of World Bank IMF that uh, Paul brilliantly highlights in his book, for example, uh, you know, social security, even to those which are without wage work, conditional cash transfers or basic income uh, could also be incorporated in something like that, can be seen as measures to transform to transfer some resources to the surplus segments in order to be able to maintain the political stability in these economies. There's extensive work by Partha Chatterjee who points out particularly in his analysis of democratic polities, this function uh, that has to be carried out. In that sense, what uh, you know, Kamak argues is the OECD vision to provide protectionism, even in informal jobs, that can be seen as a way to manage this political crisis. 
a segment that is not economically functional to capital. In fact, this is quite evident in the discourse, in the shift in uh, World Bank's discourse uh, to poverty management that you were highlighting, or in terms of rediscovering informality as micro-entrepreneurial, et cetera, to which small loans or some other resources are to be transferred. Mike Davis, in fact, in his brilliant work, Planet of Slum, highlights exactly this inability of capital to absorb this dispossessed labor, uh, which were dispossessed from the traditional sites, and how they often need to be managed because they're not pro proletarianized. Um, and then the pressure from below the decentralization and stuff can kind of be seen as these welfare measures to manage poverty of this dispossessed mass, which is not absorbed uh, by capital and it which it economically does not lead. So I'm going to end here with my second part point that follows from the argument above which is this, this, the book kind of has this desire to view capitalism as a homogeneous whole. But I feel there is probably a Eurocentric lens in that analysis, which is this expectation that uh, over time, teleologically, what's going to happen is this transformation of capitalism with only capitalist spaces. Uh, you know, all that is solid melts into gold, uh, in which case all labor is accessed by capital. In fact, borrowing from Gibson Graham, capitalism and particularly in its post-colonial reality, is specifically marked not by a homogeneity, but a difference, whereby capitalism encompasses both capitalist and non-capitalist segments, but it is still capitalism because the conditions of reproduction of the capitalist appropriative class dominantly prevails. And the role of these global institutions then can be seen not merely as one to bring labor to be accessed by capital to, to be, to, feast upon, rather to manage these contradictions, and not just that of capital and labor, rather also those of capital and it's outside the non-capitalist spheres that are produced precisely as an outfall of capital's logic. So I'll stop there. And thank you, uh, Paul, again. I really enjoyed reading this very brilliant work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sari, for these um, uh, very interesting uh, provocative comments. I look forward to the discussion uh, later on. But uh, before that, we are moving on to our um, uh, second commentator, Lucia Pradella. Do you want to go ahead? Thank you. And uh, thank you, uh, Paul, for writing your book. I think this is a very important book. And um, one of its main arguments is that the OECD and the World Bank policies actually aim at imposing the rule of capital over labor in order to ensure the social conditions for the expanded uh, reproduction of capital. And so Paul uh, sees uh, these um, institutions as basically um, leading a class struggle from above at the, at the global level. And uh, in this book, Paul illustrates this argument by presented, uh, presenting OECD and World Bank policy advice since the 60s and showing that uh, this has proceeded unabated uh, throughout crisis and global pandemics and so on. I think I uh, agree with uh, Paul's attempt to identify the uh, laws underlying the global development of the capitalist system. And uh, I also agree, of course, that uh, Marx's law of capital accumulation is key in this respect. And this law allow us, allows us to see that not only is capitalism leading to increasing precarity among workers, but it's also expanding both the global reserve army of labor and the class of wage laborers, making uh, workers living and uh, working conditions more interconnected. So um, the current situation, from my point of view, actually confirms, as uh, as Paul himself uh, says, that um, um, the development of capitalism would expand class polarization and basically confirms the situation in which uh, the proletarians and the propertyless at the global level are confronted and oppressed by the product of their own labor. And I think that uh, in the wake of COVID and uh, the war in Ukraine, we see how this uh, antagonism has um, become uh, even more dramatic to the point that even Ox Oxfam is talking about um, 
the unprecedented catastrophe that actually connects the conditions of uh, work and um, living conditions of workers, both in, in, the, in the global south and uh, in the global north, where taxi drivers, security guards, nurses were on strike today, uh, teachers, cooks, cleaners, factory workers, gig economy workers who don't have saving and actually work for poverty wages um, cannot really, um, are at risk of uh, not being able of surviving. And this kind of situation, this kind of crisis that uh, we're, we're facing characterizes both countries in the global south and in the global north. And I think that uh, Paul's book, it's interesting because it makes it possible to understand that this situation is not an aberration, uh, but it's to some extent the outcome of the politics of global competitiveness and the process of globalization of industrial production that has led to what the OECD um, believes is a quite unexpected phenomenon, which is the convergence in the nature of work between developing and developed countries. While for the OECD, this convergence is pretty unexpected, we see in capital already in a uh, in the 1870s, that Marx predicted that if China developed industrially, this would have pushed capitalists in Europe to try and push down wages and conditions uh, to the Chinese level. So he identified uh, both the tendency towards the generalization of uh, industrial production, but also this tendency towards uh, global competitiveness and the kind of downward pressure that uh, it puts on wages and uh, working conditions. And I also agree that um, contrary to the prevailing definitions of precarity, uh, which are based on a fundamental counterposition between stable and uh, precarious employment, if we adopt a global perspective and start from the global south, the precariat doesn't appear to be a new dangerous class, but it's actually the dominant form taken by the working class under peripheral capitalism. And so what the globalization of industrial production has led to as, is a generalization of these forms of employment that have manifested the inherent precarity uh, in the condition of wage labor. Now, in terms of what, what I think about the areas where I disagree or I think uh, Paul could push his analysis uh, further, is that, of course, both the World Bank and the OECD value market competitiveness. And as you said, this is because their underlying goal is to reduce the value of the labor power. But I think that on this regard, a closer investigation of Marx's law of development uh, of capital accumulation is needed because even if the OECD or the World Bank use the language of productivity and upgrading, the concept of productivity is very different from Marx's concept of uh, productivity or even exploitation. And since they don't look at the hidden abode uh, of production, these institutions don't differentiate between increasing outputs due to increasing productivity and increasing and outputs due to increasing work intensity or longer working hours. So they don't differentiate, of course, between absolute and relative surplus value extraction. But this difference is quite important in order to understand the stratification and differentiation of the conditions of the working class internationally. And as my as in capital, it's the productivity differentials uh, between countries that lead to processes of transfer of value from capitals in less developed countries to capitals in more developed countries. And these, um, the former, so capitalists in less developed countries seek to, to compensate these transfers, which limit the possibility of productive investment by increasing the absolute exploitation of the working class through what uh, Mauro Marini called the forms of super exploitation, like lengthening the working uh, times, intensifying the working day, and reducing wages to below the value of the labor power. 
So um, despite the emphasis of the World Bank and the OECD on automation, in the neoliberal period, these methods of absolute exploitation have actually played quite a central role, not only in the global south, but also in the rich countries of the European Union and the United States, where uh, we have witnessed the growth, for example, of in-work poverty that has been accompanied by the lengthening of working time times of full-time employees. And uh, the question of working time, I think it's quite interesting, that has returned as a key question also in the kind of re-emergence of the labor movement in the, in the UK, where workers are not just fighting for higher wages, but they are also fighting uh, over time and um, uh, long, long working hours. Um, and I think the differentiated analysis of exploitation is also important in order to understand the persisting hierarchies between countries, uh, between countries internationally, and the role of the states uh, in that they try to reproduce or rather challenge these inequalities by intervening in support of their own capitalist class. So at the beginning of the book, you argued that uh, Marx and Engels identified the world market, but not a world of capitalist states as the focus of their inquiry. But from my point of view, this ignores that uh, for Marx, the, sta the state plays quite a key role in the genesis of industrial capital, so in processes of primitive accumulation. Uh, also by means of colonial conquest, and given the antagonistic nature of the system, as you argue yourself, Paul, the state continues to play a central role in the reproduction of the system. And from my point of view, this helps explain why the OECDs or the World Bank's promoting the development of capitalism on a global scale is entirely consistent with their promoting the interest of the most centralized capital in the West and also the subordination of the economies in the global South. And if we look at China, we see that China industrialized precisely because it ignored World Bank's recommendations and selectively followed the logic of global compatibility competitiveness. And now uh, it's actually challenging uh, the global order, intensifying international, international conflict. And I think that in order to understand these international conflicts and the stratification of workers' conditions in, internationally, we need to look at them against the backdrop of uh, Marx's law of capital accumulation on a global scale. And so worker struggles for better wages and conditions in even in countries like the United, uh, the United Kingdom, need to oppose both imperialism and the logic of competitiveness, proposing instead the logic of international working class solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for another set of um, very uh, interesting and provocative comments. So I'm sure Paul has a lot to respond uh, to there uh, from both. But uh, before we hand back to Paul, uh, I wonder if there's anyone who um, would like to ask a question. So feel free to raise your hands. We can take a couple. I see Alex has already got his hand up. Go ahead, Alex. OK. Um, thanks very much, Paul, for your presentation and indeed your book and to Sorbi and Lucia for really great and provocative comments. I just wanted to um, make three points. Um, Paul, you present in a very interesting way the World Bank and the OECD as the if you like, the representatives of capital in general. Now, this is a concept that Marx uses in the Grundrisse. And there's a famous passage, which you must know, where he says, capital in general exists only as an abstraction. In other words, it's um, a property or tendency or feature of the system as a whole. Um, and concrete forms of capital don't necessarily correspond to capital in general. I prefer to, I'd like to add to Marx that capital in general may exist as an ideology. And it seems to me that that's really what you're showing, that these two uh, inter international institutions are 
if you like, propagandists for a particular liberal capitalist version of bourgeois ideology. That's one point. It's, it's related to a second point. You talk about a general law of capitalist production. And I'd like to ask, when you say it's a law, what do you mean by that? I mean, Sorby raised the question of um, functionalism as a potential criticism of your, your argument. Now, the way of rebuffing criticisms of functionalism is to identify the mechanisms that permit that law to operate. Um, and I'd like to know your thoughts about that, because there's this general schema that these institutions put forward and have put forward, as you show, for decades. But how is that schema realized? So, except as an ideology that may or may not have an influence on other international institutions, states, the European Commission, and so on and so forth. But then we go deep into a political process. Now, the third point I want to make is often when we talk about laws in the case of Marxist analysis of capitalism, we talk about tendencies. Well, it seems to me that there are certainly quite powerful counter tendencies to the general law of um, capitalist, capitalist production. I mean, Sobe talked about um, a kind of over homogenized view of capitalism, and she raised that with respect to the global south, but I think you could say it also about the global north. Um, you know, you say this general law um, requires workers to be um, homogenous and easily replaceable units. Well, it doesn't always work like that. Um, often capitalist firms are dependent upon workers with particular skills. You know, one of the things that's frustrating the central banks at the minute, where they're trying to force up unemployment, is that it isn't rising quickly enough. And one reason, it seems, why that's so is because employers are hanging on to workers, because um, the, they lost um, a valuable chunk of their workforce during, with all the disruptions of the pandemic, and they don't want to happen that again. Uh, that to happen again. And often that will be because those workers have particular skills that are of valuable to the, the capitalists. In a way, this relates to Lucia's point about the ambiguity of productivity in these, these schemas. Does it mean product, the ability to raise productivity through higher skills or simply squeezing people, people harder? Where it involves real skills that can enhance productivity, uh, it's not so easy just to replace workers. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Sean, we'll take one question from Sean and then we'll give it back to Paul and then we'll take another round. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Paul, nice to see you. Uh, too bad you couldn't hey, come down Sean. here. Nice to see you. <laughs> so it's kind of shocking to me that you uh, continue to agree with yourself more and more each year, especially now that uh, you know the US is launching Cold War II against Russia and China. So I mean, you know, the so-called, uh, like these paragons of a nationless globalization, like McDonald's and Coca-Cola, you know, even they had to leave Russia. And the U.S. is launching a full frontal attack on Chinese semiconductors and advanced technology, not only forcing U.S. firms out of China, but also Taiwanese, South Korean, Japanese, European, et cetera. So, uh, you know, again, I, mean, I know we've been debating this since 2014, but I mean, again, the state is not just an executive bourgeoisie, executive committee of the bourgeoisie. There is a, a, a national security logic that is that can be against the um, the interests of capital. I mean, none of these firms want to leave. McDonald's does not want to leave Russia, and certainly these American semiconductor firms do not want to leave China. I mean, Qualcomm does like 60% of its business in China, um, and yet they have to leave because of the U.S. national security state uh, compelling them to. So. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how do you reconcile these events over the past few years with, with your, uh, your framework? Thank you. And I hope your garden is, is good. It's covered in snow at the moment, uh, rather, <laughs> rather un uninviting. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, shall I, shall I briefly come back? Is that sensible? Yeah, 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 you can go ahead. And then we can take the rest of the questions afterwards, because you have a lot to work with now. So. I, I do, but not a lot I can say in, in response. I'll, I'll be brief, and I'll just give some pointers. Um, so the, all very uh, uh, 
challenging and, and interesting comments. Uh, there's a, there is a major difference between Sulby and myself, and it's not that I believe in functionalism and she doesn't, it is that she thinks I believe in functionalism and I don't in the slightest. Absolutely not. There's not a single, I challenge you to, to find a single word or sentence in the book that suggests that the proof that areas that you call non-capitalist and give your own take on, which I don't disagree with, uh, are, are somehow functional for capital. I think absolutely the opposite. And the reason I think that is I go, I, I take you take it from Marx, I, I take it from uh, from Martha Jimenez, the idea that uh, reminding us that throughout the history of, of capitalist expansion, there is always a structural surplus of workers. And that's because capital produces its own surplus by continually, as I said, as the quotes that I put forward suggested, throwing workers out of work as new processes come in more productive and more part of the churning or, or creative destruction. What I do think about the, uh, I, I would much rather talk about the case of India I've read one or two of the pieces you've been, you, and, and they're very uh, informative and, and very important. But there's a one point where, where you say, um, I'm talking about India, but really we can talk about post-colonial capitalism. I think that's a really, really dangerous thing to say. One third of the, you know better than I do, one third of the world's population, the huge majority in the future of uh, workers, if you like to put it that way, outside the capitalist system are specifically in India. You couldn't say the same with China. Uh, you'd have to make a different case for most of Africa. It wouldn't apply to Latin America. So I think what we're talking about is India as the last global reserve, or if you want to use that term, of a population which is clearly outside uh, the reach of, of capital. My uh, argument actually would be quite close to yours. It's a problem for the OECD and the World Bank, and precisely for the reasons you say. And it's exactly the same kind of problem as the 1.50% of unemployed youth between the ages of, of 16 and 24 is in Western Europe. It threatens, exactly, precisely, threatens the stability of, uh, of the capitalist core in this particular case. So belatedly, and I did say it's only a, a theme the World Bank has taken up, and you, you'll be familiar with the stuff they've brought out, uh, in, in very recent years, they've started to address this question of informality. And uh, it's clearly a problem for them. But I, I don't believe that the uh, dispossessed or the, or the uh, excluded populations that you talk about are in the slightest functional for capitalism. So that's one thing we might need to discuss before we could take the, the discussion any further. Uh, I'll just make one comment too on, uh, on Eurocentrism. Uh, um, I can't understand this point being made. The whole thrust of my argument is that the OECD and the World Bank don't specifically care tuppence for European capitalism. My argument, right or wrong, is that they care for the continued development of capitalism on a global scale. And they haven't lifted a finger or said a single thing to protect European capital against any competitors outside of Europe. In fact, as I showed from the very beginning in 1961, Thorkel Christensen comes along and says, you might be top dogs now, but your days are numbered. You are gonna face increasing competition from uh, the rest of the world. Those are the fundamental laws of history. You can't avoid them. You have got to accommodate yourselves to this changing position. And we can see now what the, the, the weight of Europe in the Western Europe in the global economy is about 12, 13% these days, compared to 25% a generation ago. So. I think Eurocentric is the wrong word. Uh, I'd be happy for you to say my analysis is capital centric. Uh, I, I'd own up to that. But, but the fact is, and this comes to a point that Alex made, these are both analytical and ideological institutions. And I'll come to it in, a, in relation to, briefly in relation to Lucia in a minute. They, they do uphold an ideology, a liberal ideology, in which they profess to believe that capitalism is good for everyone. They know it isn't. They know they've got no way of guaranteeing if, the, if they continue to promote the turbulent processes they do, that they won't drive half the world's population into poverty and ruin, not only in the so-called developing world, but in the advanced countries as well. That's the nature of capitalism. So they're trying to keep the show on the road. And in that sense, they exactly are class warriors on behalf of capital. 
but they have an ideology at the same time. I'll transit quickly to, to, to Lucia because um, I think it was, it might have been Alex. Oh, no, no, absolute relative surplus value. Exactly. No, I completely disagree on one level, but I agree on another. If you read Jobs, the 2013 World Development Report, it absolutely stresses on every single page the need for jobs to be, quote, good jobs attached to the world market with, with higher levels of investment in the worker and high levels of productivity. Where they're kidding themselves is that in everyone in the world can have a job like that. But they absolutely do recognize the difference. And when they talk about informality, they specifically say the problem with workers who are not um, skilled and they're not employed by uh, viable capitalist concerns, they earn a pittance and they're subjected to, you know, uh, other uh, inequalities in their in their lives. So they do and they don't acknowledge the difference between absolute and relative surplus value, but they do advocate uh, what you jobs that generate relative surplus value specifically. They um, so and um, then the question of states and and um, the, the OECD and the and the World Bank. Yes, of course it's true. The OECD and the World Bank could be advocating policies that favour a single European Western a uh, single global. Again, a single world hegemonic state as the US might once have been or Sean, Sean thinks it still is or a group of advanced Western economies but the fact is they don't it's not true I mean I, I'm I should say subject to debate between us it's not true that China went its way without access to the World Bank there's a massive information on the successive World Bank missions to China from 1985 onwards uh, and there's a guy down in Cambridge retired now Adrian Wood who was on those and there's a huge amount of documentation about the discussions that took place. And the discussion that took place between the World Bank and China in those years before up to 1990 was that the World Bank, i.e. the small group of somewhat renegade individuals who had gone to at, uh, the Bank of China's request to China, they agreed with the Chinese leaders that it was appropriate for state companies to dominate and they discussed with the Chinese authorities, uh, with, with their agreement, except on the question of a dual currency, they discussed the question of making those state enterprises more efficient so they could become global, so, so, so they could become sources of accumulation within the Chinese economy. So I think it's not necessarily, uh, I, mean, I, I disagree that, that China went its own way and that's why it succeeded. Um, you know, joining WTO, all this kind of stuff. The fact is, China has become a, a dynamic hub in, the, in an evolving global economy, and it's put a lot of Western European and other economies into the shade. And that's what Thorkill Christensen meant when he talked about the fundamental forces of history. I'm, I'm getting animated here. She's, she's very good at my age. So good. So, Alex. Yeah, capital in general exists only as an abstraction. It's true. But it is an abstraction that can be seen as a real abstraction in terms of the logic of what policies are appropriate to what. And it's one that can, can be meaningfully represented, in fact, more so by international organisations of a particular kind than, than by any state or certainly any individual capitalist. So I see the OECD and the World Bank specifically, I say in the book, as organisations that happened to be created at different moments of liberal ascendancy in the global economy, 1944 or 1961, moments when there was more of a commitment to the old Adam Smith type liberal idea. And, their, and their goal, the role they were given by the international community was to promote capitalism on a global scale. Now, the question is, do the policies they advocate, uh, just exactly as you said to me, can they be uh, shown to be more than a simply an ideology, and I, I hurried at the end, and, and I didn't spell it out in detail, but they derived exactly from the tendencies or imminent tendencies or whatever of uh, the capitalist mode of production as, as uh, revealed by, by Marx. Given a world in which individual capitalists compete with each other, given the consequence of in, incessant 
division of labor, incessant technological change, all those. Marx, it's not me, it's not me that invented the idea of a, of a law of social production. That's, that's Marx in capital. And he says that what will happen is, call it, call it a tendency, um, talk about countervailing products, but it has happened that workers will increasingly in the strong in capitalist uh, uh, I was going to say social formations uh, will increasingly be required if they want to make a living to be flexible, versatile and mobile. Well, I would I would happily um, wager that there is no better prediction from the 1860s of what the global economy might be like in 150 years time. Something in that is spot on about today's world. That's why I value the Marxist analysis so much. Didn't have to have happened. There are countervailing tendencies. But the fact is, and I think this is, I'll end on this and say one thing about Sean's comments. Uh, it's, it's very often assumed, and, just, and people have said today in some ways, that the, uh, the poor conditions that workers face in the developing world are now replicated by similar conditions in the developed world. And in terms of individual individual circumstances, that's true. But there is a huge difference between uh, the, old, the old reserve army of labor of whenever the 19th century and the zero hour contract worker today. The zero hour contract worker today may or may not be in a in a mainstream business, but very often is plugged into the most advanced sectors of capitalist accumulation and, and stripped down to the barest uh, role of playing this very small part that Marx identifies when he talks about the tendency for machinery to break down processes of production into their most minutest parts. In other words, it's a sign of the huge efficiency of, industry, of production today and the grip that capital exerts over individual workers. And I think if we don't accept that, uh, we're kidding ourselves about the state of class struggle in the, in these uh, in this period. And uh, sure, yeah, no, we, we just we disagree. Um, I don't uh, want to enter into the question of security and America's third Cold War. Just to say that the OECD and the World Bank have no view on that, have no activity on that, and have no uh, and have nothing to say about that. And so. Um, <laughs> So I don't either. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I do ignore entirely the security dimension of global politics because I'm not equipped to analyze it. So I'm, I'm bracketing that off, if you like. That was quite long. Sorry, I'll stop there. No, that was great. Uh, so we'll take another round of questions. And then uh, in the answers, uh, Serbian Lucia, if you want to come in again, of course, you you can come in uh, when we after you've taken the questions. Um, so, oh, let's see. Someone's in the waiting room. Okay. Uh, so there are two questions in the chat. So um, those of you that haven't put stuff in the chat, if you want to raise your hand, you can do that. Well, I'll think, I don't know if you've seen them, Paul, but um, I can no, read I'm them. not looking at the chat. I can um, read them I can out. I can read them out, yeah. So um, unless someone that put this question wants to read it, to ask it themselves. So one is Hillel Friedman. Um, so they say, Paul, thank you for a fine introduction. Please, could you relate your research to two concrete aspects of the global market? First, that over a third of global exports are intra-company rather than inter-company, with up to half of US exports being intra. Second, the top three, 300 metropolitan areas produce over 50% of global GDP, many of who are in the emerging economies. These metropoles are closer to each other globally than they are to their hinterland locally, especially in emerging economies. Do these aspects confirm the general trajectory of your hypothesis? Is the question. Oh, <laughs> uh, and then the second one in the chat is from uh, Kishore Birdikar, uh, who says, Paul, thanks for a wonderful presentation. I was thinking if citizen has replaced labor. Do we have to think of Marxist lessons as citizens and not necessarily as labor? I mean, use Marxist insights for citizen, citizenship rights since production is so decentralized. Um, any other questions from people, audience? Oh, I don't understand the second question. Do you think Kishore would like to say something about it or? 
Um, Kishore, are you still here? I think it's about, Hi. oh, yeah. Hi, this is Kishore. Hi, hi, Paul. Oh, hi, hi. 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 nice to see you. Nice to see you. The, the, the thing was that the question, I mean, uh, Global South or, or also in uh, places in Global North also, like we saw in US also, the question of citizenship and question of access to all kinds of resources from the state, not only wages, but question of water, question of sanitation, question of, uh, so these are made as citizens not necessarily as uh, labor and workers. And especially uh, sitting here in South, my research is on slums and VA, where I increasingly, I learned the questions as citizenship questions, not as labor questions. And this is, we are talking about uh, the, the reserve army, if you want to think in that way. So the question is, I'm seeing these uh, wonderful insights of Mark can and can they be now uh, and and learning from people like rosa luxemburg and uh, ye can we can we use them for for uh, citizenship tr struggles or is that's 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 the basic uh, question i can understand now thank you yeah yeah i got that um, okay let's so, take uh, one more question and then now pass it yeah. to and, and serbia and which if you want uh, so jason Hi, thanks. Uh, thank you for wonderful presentation, Paul. Um, I was wondering if um, works in international relations that have more sociologically oriented approaches like practice theory, and I'm also thinking of works like Desiree and Garth, uh, Internationalization of Palace Wars, looking at how professionals within certain uh, fields develop their, their expertise and their know-how. If those types of approaches are at all complementary in terms of understanding the micro processes by which different actors within these organizations develop their you know, repertoire of policies and so forth, or if you view that as kind of just doesn't really fit at all in your overall um, Marxist schema, if there's a fundamental incompatibility or if it can be complementary. Thanks. Yeah, you've got me on a weak point there. So I'll start with that question. Um, one thing I, I decided, I, my, without going into my biography, um, I was in a, my first exposure to international politics. And I, when I left the UK with a degree in English literature, was to go to Chile in 1971 as a volunteer to teach English. Um, and I went back and studied Latin American politics after that. And I promised myself when I started to do that, that I would never speak to uh, anyone whose politics I disagreed with in the course of my academic work, which proved quite a handicap in relation to the OECD and the World Bank. I've never visited either institution. I've never spoken to anyone who works for them knowingly. And I have, um, uh, I actually do know, because you do read about people's backgrounds, that many of the people who work for both organizations are sincere liberals and even more, have more radical views in many cases. And we all know of people who've, for good reason, gone and worked for those organizations, despite misgivings about what they, what they might stand for more broadly. But I'm, I'm afraid the sociology of professions in general and in relation to the OECD and the World Bank in particular is a completely closed book to me. And that may be a weakness of my, uh, of my analysis. So what I'm very impressed by, and, uh, and this is having read every single World Development Report and every annual I could lay my hands on over 60 years from the OECD, is the enormous consistency of the ideas that they promote. So they're certainly doing something to, um, to, to either discipline people or train them up, wherever it, wherever it might be. But I, I shouldn't say much more because I haven't got much more to say, obviously. Um, then I'll go re re reverse order. Citizenship. I think there is a very strong argument implicit in the book about the relationship between workers, the worker identity, if you like, and the citizen identity. And it's a very bleak one. And it comes out most strongly in that brief reference I made to the World Bank's human uh, capital index. The World Bank literally sees, I mean, they may or may not get anywhere with it, they literally see people born these days 
as potential workers in 20 years time. And they want everything in the social systems in which they grow up to conduce to their being the best possible servant of capital. So they begin with this, it's very, it's very um, crude in a way. They say, well, look, not everyone survives into adulthood. Not everyone uh, survives into adulthood with good health. Not everyone survives into adulthood with good skills. But if everyone did, and th this is where the, you can see the capitalist logic of the millennial development goals and all that kind of stuff as well. If everyone did, we would double global productivity. So, and it goes back again to the question of, do they, do they have coherent policies? They do. How do you make citizens into servants of capital? By removing other alternative measures of support from them. And we, we, we all know perfectly well, I don't need to go into detail, social, the reform of social protection, pioneered by the World Bank, strongly supported by the OECD, among others, to make every single aspect of what we used to call benefits conducive to pushing people back into the labour market and pushing them towards accumulating skills that are of direct benefit to capital. So I take a pretty bleak view of this issue of citizenship. And I think what, what the, uh, and again, I think we shouldn't kid ourselves. Uh, looking at, you know, I don't want to go on, go on about my age or the people that are older than me, no doubt, are listening. Compare my childhood and my, ch and my ch opportunities to those of my uh, grandchild or children today. There's been a huge transformation in favour of capital. Doesn't mean to say that capital will win out in the end. But people are so much more uh, lacking in alternative opportunities, and primarily in the in the, in the advanced economies, there's, there's more possibility where you're not so tied into, you know, I don't even need to say it, student loans, uh, conditional employment benefits. Um, so I think the project could be redescribed in a sentence as shaping citizens as willing workers for capital. And that is what citizenship comes to mean if, if, this, um, if these sets of policies uh, succeed. Um, that's a that's pretty, uh, pretty grim thought. But that's why I have that quote from Marx at the end. Freedom for capital is, is slavery for the individual. In a world in which capital really is free and calls the shots, people have bleak prospects outside of its, uh, outside of its grip. So in the third one, yeah, uh, okay, so the, the, the concentration of, of capital in, in the metropolises and in the top 300 countries. Most of what I talk about in the book, and this is what I think the consequence of having looked at the OECD, rather than having looked just at, rather than make a distinction, which I don't believe is operative between advanced countries and developing countries, and the World Bank works as one lot, and, uh, you know, the... OECD works with the other lot. Most of what the OECD does is directly concerned with the advanced economies. Tries to, it's got a, a long history that I document in the book of trying to bring uh, emerging economies in on the grounds of its conviction that they will, in due course, be dominant uh, uh, capitalist countries themselves. But it mostly advises governments on what to do to preserve the hegemony of capital over labour. And that relates to, um, you know, I'm not saying the US governments or, or European governments listen all the time, but its focus is, OECD's focus, is on the so-called rich countries. And they continually urge the state to support the kinds of reforms that will make productive workers available to capital. In other words, to existing uh, firms. They also, and this is equally important, they also, all the way through, and especially through through COVID and the pandemic, insist on the need for creative destruction to operate as a disciplinary mechanism. They're so in the final chapter, I, I quote them as saying, whatever you do when you're offering temporary subsidies in, in response to COVID, don't fund firms that you don't believe have a future. Let them go out of business. Let the firms that can succeed, succeed. So this is just competition policy. 
And a lot of the, the work of the OECD that I don't write about at all is in relation to its dealings with the top uh, corporations uh, indirectly through, through governments and the major concentrations of capital around the world. So I don't think it's something that's, um, that impinges on the arguments that I've made, but it is something that uh, uh, you could look at alongside the things I've talked about if you wanted a fuller picture of the role of the OECD vis-a-vis -vis states in advanced economies and major centres of capitalist accumulation. That's me, I finished now. Uh, great, so before we take another round of questions, um, Serbia or Lucia, is there anything that you would like to come in and comment on again? Or... Serbia? Um, okay. Um... Thanks, Paul, for uh, very interesting responses, also uh, pushing me to think a lot about what you've said. I guess one thing I'm curious myself is that why would you say that India is the last labor reserve of that self-employed kind that I'm talking about, given that if you look at the self-employment numbers in much of the African continent, it would be ranging from 70 to 80 percent, basically. Yeah huge unemployment, et cetera. Latin America ranging from 40 to 50%, the whole of South Asia basically being in the range of 80%, uh, 60 to 80% basically. Yeah, so I just I mean gross numbers really, so that's, that's all. Sorry? I just mean gross numbers, that's all. I, I don't argue with you about the proportions. Okay, all right, yeah. So I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering why would that not be the extra labor reserve that would be available um, as surplus to be um, uh, as surplus labor. And I think one of the clarifications in terms of Eurocentric, I guess uh, one clarification that I wish to make is that it's not to argue that they would, you know, these uh, institutions get, care particularly about global North capitalist, as you uh, pointed out, but a vision of capitalism that is homogeneous. You're, you're absolutely right that insofar that you're talking, uh, you know, it's a capitalocentric vision because it's based on the idea of what uh, a Eurocentric capitalism was supposed to be. So my usage of the term Eurocentrism was uh, in, in that limited um, context. But the argument, again, that I guess, which I guess is also one of the departures, is in terms of uh, whether one could see capitalism as specifically a differentiated and heterogeneous whole rather than a homogeneous whole, where not everything would basically uh, be governed by the economic logic of capital um, as well. So yeah, but uh, thanks a lot for engaging with those. Comments. Ingrid, is it okay if we have a slight, a quick dialogue? Is that a good idea? Uh, yeah, 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 sure. I'll be brief. So, so yeah, uh, I think we, I basically think we agree, and um, by not trying to persuade you that we do. Uh, the, my perspective on global capital, uh, not the OECD, the World Bank, global capital, is that it doesn't care about the great majority of people in the world at all. And, if it, and, and the reason I would say that is, if you look at those few mechanisms that I outlined that drive the uh, development of global capitalism, capitalists compete with each other, they always trying to um, uh, survive, they have to innovate in technology and, and, and so on to uh, increase productivity. Those are very powerful tendencies or forces or whatever, but they're also very limited. Capital, because capital consists of many competing capitals, it has no ability to do anything about the workers that are outside its, its reach. And Marx says, and I agree with him, they don't, they don't care about the great majority of the population of the world, and they don't care about them precisely because they don't need them, because capitalism, capital continue, continually develops its own surplus. So you remember Marx says in Capital, and I quote it in the book, about the um, uh, uh, question of will there be a labour force in the future? The capitalists, capitalists can't think about that. They don't care about it. They say, um, uh, you know, I've got enough to do trying to survive myself as a, as a capitalist. And there is no mechanism in capitalist competition for taking any care for either the need economy or the mass of the, of the global population. And capital, to put it in a polemic way, capital doesn't care. Capital, Marx and Engels have things they say about this in relation to John Stuart Mill and Malthus, who said, oh, you, you know, there are too many people in the world. They said, yeah, that's what these people think. 
let them die. It would be much better for everybody if they if they would. So it's a much bleaker perspective, mine, I think, than in some ways than yours. I think that they, exactly as you say, they do care about the possible instability arising from people who aren't securely incorporated into a global capitalist economy. Uh, but beyond that, they don't. And uh, of course, capitalism is, is, is heterogeneous and differentiated. Always has been, always, always will be. And not to make this point to you, because I don't know that you believe it, but people who talk about Eurocentrism are overlooking the fact that Europe is differentiated and highly uh, heterogeneous. And Spain and Portugal were one thing, and Venice was another, and the Dutch was another again. And it's just, um, you know, I, I, I don't think uh, the term Eurocentrism has any analytical value whatsoever. And um, I just say that to, um, you know, <laughs> to have people turn off the recording at this point and go and, go and do something else. <laughs> we'll have to organize another seminar, maybe, on Eurocentrism. Um, and then, because uh, I'm sure Serbia has a lot to say back there, but um, but I think we should just go to the questions. Uh, uh, so we have got, we've got a lot of questions now and even a hand up. So um, there's, I think, three questions in the chat. Two mm. questions and a comment. Um, so Prashanto Dar says, how do you see the student migration at global scale of competitiveness between universities? Oh, sorry, Lucia. <laughs> I completely forgot. <laughs> okay. No problem. We'll I, first, just, then we'll do the I just wanted yeah. to make two points. So I would put it like that, uh, Paul. Why do you speak about a law uh, of production and not Marx's law of accumulation? And uh, I think that uh, I understand that, um, you know, the OECD, the World Bank um, know the difference between absolute and relative uh, surplus value. And they talk about good jobs and the potential of upgrading and technology and, and so on and so forth. And on the other side, they also, as you also talk in, um, yeah, describe in your book, they, they describe discrimination, exploitative condition, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just saying that since they follow a neoclassical framework, of course, they don't really look at the question of the quality of work, a working hour. They assume that having a job is the best route out of poverty. And in this way, they don't understand how the same processes of technological upgrading and innovation, et cetera, are the cause of increased exploitation because of the contradictions of the capitalist mode of production. So, and at the same time, this is true if we want to look at the question of the fallacy of, comp of, of uh, composition, because of course, this idea that everyone can get this uh, upgrading and, and so on and so forth is in, contra in contrast to the fact that capitalism is an uneven system that produces polarization because of the process of uh, competition and concentration and centralization of capital. So that's um, my, my first point. The second point is I really don't see how we can say that the World Bank has nothing to do with Ukraine or the current crisis in Ukraine. The World Bank is sending billions of dollars to Ukraine, is supporting liberalizing reforms, land reforms, opening up to the, to the West, et cetera. So how, how can you say that... Um, it, it doesn't matter uh, if we want to understand the current conflicts, for example, around Ukraine between NATO and, and Russia. Okay, well, it does the same for every country, so I accept that point. Uh, on your first point, um, and I forgot what I was going to say. Um, well, your first point was on... Well, I think that if we look at the question of absolute and relative surplus value and different forms of oh, exploitation, yes. uh, it's, it's quite helpful if we want to solve the fallacy of, com of composition. I remember. I, I agree with you to a point, and I agree with you to, to this extent. The World Bank is perfectly aware of, of the issues that you raise, but it's a problem for it, and the OECD as well, because they can't deliver good jobs for everyone. So there's a kind of admixture of ideology on the one hand, and how they do understand, I think, more than you allow. But the more they understand it, the more they realise they're in an intractable position where they have got to pretend that everyone can have a great job, just exactly as you say, when they know they really can't. So there's a if you were to go and look at the 
discourse, I can see how it might work in detail, you would be able to show how they were balancing advice that um, was plausible with a background recognition that it just can't work for everyone. I agree with that entirely, I do. Thank you. Uh, great. So then we'll just do uh, another round of questions. Uh, so the one by Prashanto Dar is about um, uh, how do you see the student migration on a global scale of competitiveness between universities, especially students from the South? So if you have something to say about that. And then uh, there's another one from Patrick Rose that says, uh, Adam Tooze argued in foreign policy that the US is intentionally sabotaging the World Trade Organization, free trade rules by imposing US tariffs against China, by subsidizing semi, uh, semiconductor development. Why was China admitted to the WTO when it violated its rules? Is this because the US wanted access to Chinese markets? Does US's new attack versus WTO rules signal an important shift in the world trade system? Do you address this? Does it confirm Arigi's prediction in the long 20th century? And then he links to the Tooth article. Um, Are those your two? Is there another question? Or? Those were two questions. Oh, okay. okay. Then we are supposed to ignore the hand that's up. Okay. No, please don't ignore my hand. Yeah, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> hello, uh, do you wanna ask your question? I'd like to go back to that point about how we see globalization. I mean, in a sense, it's almost going back to Italy and the 16th century to those city states, because globalization has really meant the rise of the metropolitan areas around the world and their interconnectedness. And it goes to the heart of the discussion of those who've gained and those who've lost, which is Paul's point about, and Paul, yeah, I agree with you, capitalism persona, I mean, um, the capitalist personifies the needs of capital, which is inhuman, so they don't give a shit about humanity. Um, so going back to that, it really does crystallize the discussion about uh, what has happened over the last 30 to 40 years. And we really can't understand Brexit and Trump accepting in the context of those who are integrated into the world economy and those that have been that those that have lost and it has created a great deal of political instability so these developments come always at a political cost and this is the political cost that we have to try and measure the other point i made about inter and intra trade now they they put the global economy at around 1995 uh, trillion you can knock 20% of that is just garbage, duplication, nonsense, and so on and so forth. So when you take international trade at 19 trillion, you're talking about 25 to 30% of the world economy is actually the trade between countries. So that's really important. Now, inter and intra trade has different political consequences. And I'm sure, Paul, you've looked at that. When we're talking about intra trade, so if we take the, the global car companies, we find that their levels of productivity in the various car plants around the world are similar. They're using similar technology, but wage rates can differ between 300 and 400%. So here we are talking about the issue of super exploitation. And obviously this creates a lightning rod for us if we're gonna try and build international trade unions. So the way capitalism unfolds is really, really, really important in terms of how we approach and the tactics we use to engage with that. Because unless we actually look at this terrain very, very precisely, we will never develop the correct tactics, which we gain to. Because I have to tell you, capitalism is really, really beginning to struggle. And um, I don't know if any of you saw the figures today that came out of the United States. Their Ukrainian figures are basically having to admit that the economy is actually beginning to contract very rapidly now. And that is true for the whole world economy. So we're in a different uh, historical period. And these are the issues we really need to deal with. And that's it. 
Thank you so much. So those are all the questions in this round. So yeah, how do you want to? Okay, so um, student migration between universities. I don't really have a specific comment on that, but I will say this. Um, a lot of the background to the research that I've done, uh, if I were able to write as much again about the reception of these ideas in advanced as well as in developing countries, would, would focus on the real difficulty that the OECD and the World Bank have in getting individual states to subscribe to their ideas about what a truly global liberal capitalist system would be. Uh, protection is a, is a good example. Uh, quoted uh, Christensen saying in 1961, European countries should not have protected agriculture uh, after the Second World War. They should open themselves up to agricultural production from the developing world. They still haven't listened. And this is now what, whatever it is, 60 years later. So on the one hand, they might espouse a very um, uh, pure uh, classical liberal view of what a competitive global economy might be. But on the other, they have a lot of difficulty in, in persuading states, uh, they've got no purchase over these states, to adopt these ideas. They have very great success in getting states to adopt ideas about smashing welfare states and driving up the, the disciplinary nature of social protection, because it's in the interest of states run by capitalist bourgeois governments to do that. But preliminary to say, migration is a case in point. There's never, uh, everyone, well, no, let's say, regular intervals, both organizations come out with strong pleas for much freer migration around the world for workers. And the advanced countries just don't listen. So we know that in our experience, whichever country you come from, there are huge barriers to the free movement of labor across the world. And I mentioned that because I hope to be able to talk about it today. The World Development Report to 2023 is about migration. And it will be quite interesting to see what it says about the uh, rights and wrongs of, of labor and other forms of migration across the world. But they're very much there for it. And uh, then definitely for students traveling around and exercising their right to study in different countries. But I haven't got anything more to add to that really as regards the, um, the, the analysis that I'm uh, putting forward. OEC and the World Bank strongly in favor of free movement of capital and labor and, uh, and uh, goods. Um, Adam Tews and, and, and all this kind of stuff. It just, uh, Patrick, uh, it's, it's a kind of not a very uh, erudite response, but the countervailing measures, China, US at the moment, whatever it might be, this exactly exemplifies what I've just said about the general difficulty the OECD has and the World Bank has had about getting any country to adopt the liberal maxims that it espouses. And uh, the area of protection and uh, coming back in the European Union as well, as, as you'll be aware, um, is one where the OECD and the World Bank have signally failed to influence, or at least to change, the course of, of government policy. So uh, it's, I think it's obvious what, what my book is. It's the, it's the result of, of uh, 25 years of reading nothing but World Bank and OECD publication and, and Capital Volume 1. <laughs> and it's quite a narrow in its focus. And, I, and I'm grateful it's, it's, it, the people have taken the time to read it and, and given me thought-provoking ideas about it. The fact is, it's a narrow take on the global economy and its workings, the global political economy these days. I think it does for, provide a useful purpose because I can promise that it does faithfully record the kinds of policies that the OECD and the World Bank have consistently espoused over the last um, 50 and 80 years respectively, whatever it is. And in that sense, I hope it's useful. And I think it has one thing, um, I regard as, it, as its major contribution. It shows that the thinking and the activities of the OECD and the World Bank are closely aligned and very, very similar. And that they essentially uh, work on different aspects of a shared global project 
And I don't think that's been recognized before, mainly because virtually nobody works on the OECD, which I think is crazy because it's a world bank. Too many people work on it, probably. And, um, you know, but the OECD is really neglected. Um, it's a, such a, a fruitful source of, of getting ideas about how a particular bunch of people in Paris, drawn from all over the world, think the global economy can be managed. So I'll just say that. I, my, my perspective is, is limited, uh, but I hope what I have to say about those two organisations will at least prove, um, you know, get your students to read it and I'll get some revenue from the uh, Oxford University Press. Sorry, that was just flippant, but I stopped. Um, great. So um, I think that's it. Uh, no more questions in the chat. Uh, hello, I assume that's the old hand, right? Um, a legacy hand, as they say. So uh, there's a lot of comments in the chat about thanking you for your um, presentation and for your responses. Um, so um, thanks everyone for coming and thanks Paul for, <laughs> for the presentation and for, uh, for all the, for engaging with all the comments so in so much detail. Um, thanks also to uh, Serbia and Lucia for reading the book and giving such insight, insightful and critical comments. So uh, there is another seminar coming up, uh, 10th of February, uh, that's a Friday. So deviating from the usual Wednesday uh, slot uh, with Stuart Schrader. Um, yeah, actually, I don't know the topic of the seminar, but yeah, can you say it quickly, maybe? If you know? Sorry. Well, I think um, we, we haven't uh, completely organized this because we are in the middle of uh, strike action. So we will confirm uh, the date very soon when we okay. know whether there will be. If not, it will be on the picket lines. So uh, you're very welcome to join us uh, at King's and everywhere in the country. And I think it will be about policing and the relationship between war and, and policing. Sounds great. Uh, thanks to everyone again. Solidarity to everyone that is going on strike very soon. Um, and see you next time. Have a good thank day. you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank and you. thank you, Serbi. Thank you.